Please remain standing in body or in spirit for today's scripture lesson, a reading from the gospel according to Matthew. Listen for the word of God. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And please be seated, and thank you so much, Ross, for that wonderful reading of the gospel lesson this morning. And good morning, Christ Church family. What a joy it is to be with you here today, whether you're here in person or joining us online. And, and I must just acknowledge, choir, you have taken us to church this morning. Amen? My goodness, thank you. Let us join our hearts as we continue in worship this morning in prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you meet us so powerfully in this place every week. And Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you've already made yourself known to us in, in music and song, in silence and prayer, in invitation and in fellowship, and in your word. Lord, we pray that you would continue to open our minds and our ears, our eyes, our hearts to all that you would continue to offer us today. We gladly receive all that you have for us Lord, we gratefully meet you and each other in this place. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, and all God's people said, amen. When you think about it, when, when you really think about it, some of, the, some of the very best stories are the ones that leave you wanting to hear more. You know, the, the cliffhangers, that you're wanting to hear more of it. And when I think about Matthew's gospel, it's, it's like that. It ends with what we heard this morning, and, and if we were hearing it for the very first time, it does read like a story that's still waiting to be fully told. If the Gospel of Matthew, if it were a movie, Matthew sets it up for a good sequel. And we know the sequel. We, we know it through the other Gospels. We know it through the book of Acts and the epistles and through history itself. We, we know what happens after the Great Commission as what we call it. We know what happens after that. But today, I, I want to narrow our story to what Jesus is commissioning his disciples to do and the manner in which he is instructing them to do it. They are to make disciples. They are to teach. They are to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, of course, is Trinity Sunday. It's the Sunday in which we we recognize and, and celebrate our triune God, God as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, a three-in-one God. And we don't talk much about the Trinity. You've not heard me preach much about the Trinity. No one has, to be honest with you. And, and I think that's a good thing that we don't talk a lot about the Trinity or preach a whole lot about the Trinity, because when we try to talk about the Trinity or teach or preach about the Trinity, we often do something that I call preacher-splain. We try to preacher-splain it, and we do it to the extent that we almost invariably use analogies, which almost always break down at some point and often leads us to commit unintentional acts of heresy. It, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've heard the analogies around the Trinity. I've heard the analogies around the Trinity. I've used the analogies around the Trinity that eventually break down and lead us to heresy. But we have them, and we use them, because they do begin to open our minds to the, the mere possibility of something that is not fully understandable. You've heard those analogies. The Trinity is like an egg, the shell, the white, the yolk. The Trinity is like an apple, the skin, the pulp, the seeds. The Trinity is like water, liquid, solid, and gas. The Trinity is like you or me. I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm a brother. All of those eventually break down, and if we're not careful, 
they will lead us to those common heresies of modalism or partialism or Arianism. And if you're a church nerd like I am and you want to know what those uh, words are, uh, Google it and you'll find them pretty quickly, I promise you. So then how do we talk about the story of the Trinity? How do we articulate it? The Athanasian Creed makes a pretty good stab at it. Part of it, part of it says this, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost. You got it? You got that, right? Now you fully understand and comprehend the nature and mystery of the Trinity, Right? Maybe not so much. We really do when we look at the Trinity and behold the Holy Trinity. We have to acknowledge that we are witnessing and experiencing a holy mystery. We simply don't have the language. We don't have the perspective on this side of eternity to either accurately describe or fully understand our three in one God, and that's okay. You see, the word Trinity is never used in Scripture, but it's all throughout Scripture. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God as Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. And in Matthew's story, the Trinity we see, it is steeped in the waters of baptism. Go, Jesus says, make disciples, teach, and baptize. But don't just baptize in any way. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, my friends, when you think about that, when you think about being baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, can it possibly be true that we are somehow being immersed into the fullness of God? Yes, that's exactly what's happening at our baptism. Whether we're being baptized as infants or we make up our own minds later in life to be baptized, we are being invited in to the presence and invited in into fellowship and relationship with the community of God as one, the Trinity. So what are we to make of all of this? What are we to make about this, uh, this story of the Trinity? How does it begin to be written more fully in our lives? Well, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I did a little bit of a deep dive on the Trinity this past week, and I went to our United Methodist Book of Discipline to see how we in our tradition understand the Trinity. So I looked up the Articles of Religion of the Methodist Church and the Confession of Faith of the Evangelical United Brethren Church. Yes, that's quite a mouthful, and that's where we got the United Methodist Church when those two things I'm sorry, I'm preacher-splaining things again, but this is what I found out. What do we believe about God the Father? This is what we say, our foundational documents. God is first and foremost the Creator. God is the maker and preserver of all things. God is everlasting, and God has infinite power, wisdom, goodness, justice, and love. God is holy and sovereign. God rules with gracious regard for the well-being and salvation of humankind. God chooses to reveal God's self as the Trinity, distinct but inseparable, one in substance and power and in essence. You got it now? You understand it now, right? I mean, what does that mean for us? It is kind of plain, but when I think about the story of God as Father and Creator. We see a God, friends, who certainly has created, but is creating. I I would remind us of the book of Genesis and the creation narratives, and you see God at work creating. God is creating the universe. God is creating the heavens and the earth. And, And in the narrative, day by day goes on in six days, God is creating the heavens and the earth. And I've often thought of it as if God is is, is the great and ultimate cosmic artist, and God is casting the, the heavens and the earth, the stars, and, and at the end of the day, God stands back and says, oh, that's good, admiring God's handiwork. God creates the next day and the next day and the next day. God's creating the, the plants and the animals, the air and the water, the night and the day, and eventually humankind, and God doesn't just pronounce it all good. God pronounces it very good. But our great God who has created is still creating. We are God's creation as well. And we are even created in the image and likeness of God, we are told. 
And as such, we are even being made new creations in Jesus Christ. Well, what do we believe about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity? Back to our, 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 our documents, our founding documents. It says this, Jesus is the only Son, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. The heart of the gospel is the incarnation of God in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is of one substance with the Father. In Jesus, human nature and divine nature were joined together in one person. Jesus was, therefore, born truly God and truly man. Jesus suffered, died, and was buried. He reconciled us to God with his death, was a sacrifice for the sins of humankind. He rose from the dead on the third day and ascended into heaven. He will sit there until he returns to judge all people on the last day. Is it becoming clearer, the Trinity? (laughs) No. (laughs) Maybe a little bit. There's something about the second person of the Trinity. In John's gospel, it starts this way. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it continues in that first chapter, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Or I think Eugene Peterson in the message said something like, God moved into the neighborhood or something like that. In Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, God got personal, and God showed us the true nature, the heart of the Trinity, the very heart of God, beyond rules or commandments as important as those are. He showed what went into those rules, what went into the law, and the very nature of God Himself, which is love and mercy and forgiveness. Jesus lived, and He died, and He rose that we might have life abundant and life eternal, that we might get an even clearer view of our God as Trinity. What do we say about the story of the Holy Spirit? The main role of the Spirit, according to our foundational documents, is that of Redeemer. The Spirit is of one substance with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit convinces the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and leads people through their faithful response to the gospel and to the fellowship of the church. The Spirit comforts, sustains, empowers, convicts, and enlightens. How about now? You got this Trinity thing down now? I'm still working on it myself. But when we think about the work of the Holy Spirit… After having just celebrated Pentecost last week, but acknowledging that there's always been a Holy Spirit at work, it was just at the day of Pentecost, unleashed differently and more fully onto those who were following Jesus and empowered them to share the gospel in such a way that the church was born that day. But friends, that Spirit is still roaring through the world, roaring into our life and into our church and and into our community. Are we going to be open to the story that the Spirit is writing on our hearts and in our world? When you think about it, in, in Christ and in the Father and in the Spirit, we have indeed been invited and given access to God through to the Trinity, God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we hear these words from Jesus today from the gospel lesson that we remember as the, uh, the great commission we're reminded that we're invited into relationship with God. And if we're created into the image and likeness of God, and we have a three-in-one God who's perfectly in relationship with God's self, that means we are hard-wired to be in relationship with God and other people ourselves. We are welcomed and invited and blessed to be in the presence of God and in the community of the Trinity in and through Jesus Christ. But we're also invited, indeed, like those original followers of Jesus, we're invited to be sent and to share this story and continue this story. Because the gospel story, as it's written, it was ended with you in mind, but it was also written and ended with you in mind with the idea that you would continue to live it out, that you would continue to write the story with God, 
in the hearts of other people as well. The gospel story as we hear it today, it's still being told, it's still being lived, it's still being experienced in all of our lives and in all of those who have, are, and will continue to follow after Jesus. So, here's what I want you to do about all of that. First of all, I want you to think about the people who wrote this story into your life. I, there are too many people in my life to mention, but I, I'm thinking of my, my grandmother with her uh, from the hills of North Carolina accent pulling me into her lap and telling me the stories of God from the Bible. I'm thinking about my grandmother and grandfather on the other side of my family who always had the Bible open in their living room because they read it, and they read it to me as well. And they just kept it open to where they finished, you know, the last time, and they, they picked up when they went back to it. And they drugged me to church when I didn't want to go to church when I was staying with them on, on Sundays. And it caught, and it took, and it began to take form and shape, faith did, in my heart because of them. I, I'm thinking of an associate pastor who just randomly, seemingly in my mind at least, and memory, showed up on our front doorstep one day, rang our doorbell. I answered the door. I was shocked. I didn't know ministers made house calls at that time. I thought she was looking for my parents, but she was looking for me. And as we began to talk, she wanted to know what I was going to be doing about Jesus. Was I going to follow him? And this is a tradition where you weren't baptized as an infant, and she invited me into the waters of baptism. And the rest is history, so to speak. Who wrote the story, the gospel story, on your heart? Give thanks for them today. Remember them well. Call them if they're still on this side of eternity and thank them. And then in turn, think about those people who are in your life. Maybe it's your children or your grandchildren or neighbors or friends or coworkers, but those who, who don't know God as Trinity and have experienced the love of God in Christ as you have. And somehow find a way, empowered by the Spirit, to share the story of God's love. Invite them to know God, to experience God. Maybe you invite them to something around here that they may taste and see that God is indeed good. Friends, the story is still being written, and we are the ones with God who are sharing in that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.